Welcome to the soon-to-open Museo Galeon here at the Mall of Asia. This is a museum dedicated to the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade. The place is still under construction as you can see, but when it's done by the end of the year, this place will be filled with exhibitions, artifacts, maps, and all sorts of archives relating to the Galleon trade. And the museum's centerpiece, a full-sized replica of a Galleon, a Spanish Galleon, which will be built on site for all to see. In this episode, we'll take you to Andalusia in southern Spain, where the galleons began and ended their transoceanic voyages. We'll also embark on a journey through the various wine regions of Spain and taste the best wines they have to offer. So join us, I'm David Saldran, and this is Executive Class. From the 16th to the early 19th century, galleons from Manila carried precious cargo across the Pacific to Acapulco. Mostly spices, silk, and fine porcelain from the east, in exchange for gold and silver from the mines of Spanish America. These goods from the port of Manila were carried overland to Mexico's Atlantic coast and back to Spain to the ports of Andalusia and into the hands of the merchants of Seville. The port city of Seville is no longer the trading superpower it once was, but the legacy of its virtual monopoly of maritime trade continues to be felt and seen throughout Spain's third largest metropolis and remains a compelling reason to visit. The Guadalquivir River in southern Spain was where the riches of the world flowed to and from Seville, and sea voyages to the New World and beyond often began and ended here. Seville was where Ferdinand Magellan's circumnavigation of the world set sail from and where Christopher Columbus planned his expeditions. The port city of Seville was granted a royal monopoly of trade with the Americas and during the age of discovery and of the galleon trade that followed, Seville was the economic center of the world and at its height, Europe's richest city. Seville's fortunes as a commercial hub declined when the river began silting up, and the city today is better known for its tourist trade. The grand monuments and cosmopolitan air in the city is a legacy of Seville's golden age, and the Sevillano's passion for architecture, tapas, bullfighting, and flamenco make the Andalusian capital such a joy to visit. The best way to experience Seville is in the streets of Barrio Santa Cruz, a medieval section of the old town where the city's most impressive buildings and churches are found. Okay, you can't see me, because I'm doing all the filming in this trip myself. But I'll let the scenery speak for itself. And as you can see, it's just like going back in time, to that age when Seville and Andalusia, known then as Al-Andalus, was ruled by the Moors from North Africa. The maze of streets in Santa Cruz is fun to navigate, even if it's easy to get lost in it. The houses are typical of Andalusia, a mix of Islamic and Christian Spanish styles adapted to the hot southern climate. The cobbled streets, bordered by tall buildings on both sides, provided natural shade to passersby. Homes were painted white or in pale and pastel shades, or sometimes with tiles, to reflect or diffuse the harsh sunlight. And to keep cool, Balconies to ventilate the houses were crucial. Seville's ancient urban planners had the foresight to plant thousands of orange shade trees and build hundreds of fountains in the courtyards and squares of the city. Air conditioning and increasingly outdoor misting systems have rendered these traditional architectural features obsolete. But they're what makes Seville and the towns of Andalusia in general so beautiful. If ever you're lost in the maze of Santa Cruz, just look up for La Giralda, the city's tallest tower, and follow the paths that lead to it. This is Seville's most recognizable landmark, 
and one of three UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the city. The Cathedral of St. Mary of the Sea is said to be the largest of its kind in the world, a grand Gothic masterpiece, unrivaled in size and majesty in Europe. The Giralda was a former minaret of a mosque on the same site. It was converted after the Christian reconquest of Seville into a bell tower and named after El Giraldillo, the statue on top. The steep climb up La Giralda provides stunning 360-degree views of the rooftops of the old town of Seville. The cathedral is built to show off Seville's growing influence and wealth, and as one of those who oversaw its construction said, let us build a church so beautiful and so grand that those who see it finished will think we are mad. Yes, mad indeed. I've seen many cathedrals in my lifetime, but this is a work of madness. Not just the size, but the amount of silver and gold used to embellish it. And why not? Seville could easily afford it anyway, thanks to the expeditions of men like Christopher Columbus, whose remains, at least parts of it, are buried here. If you have little time in Seville, I suggest sticking to the streets and squares around the cathedral where the city's top sites are located. Just east of the cathedral, along Avenida de la Constitución, are elegant buildings in the unique Neo-Mudejar architectural style influenced by Seville's Moorish past. Close by is another must-see, Seville City Hall, the Ayuntamiento, with its lavishly decorated facade funded, no doubt, by taxes collected from the city's merchants. Facing the main entrance of the cathedral is Real Alcazá, in my opinion, the only other building in Seville that can rival, no, even surpass it in glory. Seville's Alcazá is one of the most beautiful in all of Spain, equal in grandeur, perhaps, to Granada's legendary Alhambra. Both were former royal palaces of Moorish rulers and caliphs. Seville's Alcazar, however, was largely rebuilt by the Castilian monarchs that made it their own after the Reconquista. The Christian rulers were so impressed by what the Moors left behind, they kept most of it, and what they rebuilt, they patterned after it. This style is known as Mudejar, which incorporates Moorish and Christian, Eastern and Western symbols and sensibilities in the choice of materials and design. The product is one of the most beautiful palaces in the world, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the ultimate exotic film set as well. Parts of the fifth season of Game of Thrones was shot here, as were the films Lawrence of Arabia and Kingdom of Heaven. The Alcazar was more than a pleasure palace. During the Age of Discovery, the Casa de Contratación, housed within its walls, acted as a global center of maritime power and trade. The Alcazar is still a royal residence, and the king and queen of Spain often spend some time here. But visitors are welcome year-round, and allowed to roam and linger within its manicured gardens and sprawling grounds. Exiting the Alcazar takes you through the winding streets of the old Jewish quarter, a gentrified part of the old town, now famous for its bars and restaurants. Seville may lack northern Spain's palaces of modern gastronomy and superstar chefs, but the city more than makes up for this with a food scene that's exceptionally vibrant and authentic. Sevillanos like to keep it rustic and unpretentious, honest and hearty food that's faithful to traditional recipes and the Andalusian spirit. Start your tour at the Mercado de Triana on the river, where locals stay to eat and shop for produce. If you find that too hot, dark, or rustic, the sunlit Lonja de Barranco Gourmet Food Market across the bridge is an air-conditioned and chic alternative. Seville is called Spain's tapas capital, and a series of small bites are meant to be eaten in as many bars as possible and as many neighborhoods you can cover. 
at Bar El Comercio in Santa Cruz. The evening begins with a glass of vermouth and a plate of jamón ibérico de bellota from Habugo. Bars in Seville tend to specialize in just a few things, and at Álvaro Perejil's Taberna La Goleta across the cathedral is her 18th century orange wine, Vino de Naranja. The Arenal neighborhood on the opposite side of the cathedral is another popular area for tapas. Casa Morales, founded in 1850, is legendary. Tapas like Montedito's are best enjoyed standing, and in Andalusia, where Sherry is from, with a glass of crisp manzanilla wine. The bars in El Arenal come alive especially before and after a bullfight in the area nearby. The Plaza de Toros de la Maestranza is Andalucía's premier bullring, and along with Madrid's the most famous in Spain. Football has replaced the corrida, the bullfight, as a national obsession in Spain, but in Seville it's still wildly popular. The corrida is billed as a match to the death between man and beast, but in reality, it's a one-sided affair in favor of the matador. The bull is weakened with stabs to its back, first with lances, then later with pairs of banderillas. And then, the coup de gras. The matador makes passes at the raging bull with his cape, before striking it down with one final bloody act. Bullfighting has been criticized as cruel entertainment, and some cities in Spain have banned it. But Sevillanos intend to keep the art of the torreo alive, a tradition they insist is as integral to Andalusia as their passion for wine, tapas, and flamenco. After the break, we'll show you more treasures from Andalusia. We'll visit the former Moorish capital of Cordoba and taste the prized sherry wines of Jerez. That and more when Executive Class returns after the break.